Hi, everybody. Welcome to our, our digital session here about advanced framing. Uh, that's Tim over there, and that's Mike over there. Um, these two guys are, are legendary in their own respects uh, as far as being accomplished builders. So this is a, you know, I'm thrilled to be sharing, a, sharing the screen with them. Uh, so let's dig in. Um, this is kind of a, this, this topic has a lot of little tentacles. So I think once we get up and running, it's going to kind of take on its own momentum. But should we just start with um, what's a quick little definition in your own words, guys, of what, what you, how you guys think of advanced framing? Because it's not, it's not, um, you know, the 201 level of framing. It's not like, you know, expert level framing. It's a different type of framing. It used to be called optimum value engineered or optimal value engineered. Is that right, Mike? Um, I, I don't remember. We'll have to look I mean, back at Scott McBride's old article from the early 80s. <laughs> yeah, and that was what, 70s, 80s? And back then it seemed to be mostly about resource conservation. It wasn't, it was mostly about how do we use less lumber? Yep. Um, it seems to have shifted in more recent years to how do we leave more room for insulation? Mm -hmm. um, although using less lumber is still, still obviously a good benefit. So you save money in, in a lot of ways. Um, you guys have both been using advanced framing, what, on all builds? Or when did you start using them? Uh, tell us a little bit of, of your background. Let's go with you first, Mike. Uh, started using it back in the late 80s, early 90s. Had known about it a little before then, but we were, my friend Rick Arnold and I were running framing crews and we made a deal with a builder. We were, it wasn't track housing, so to speak, but it was a, in a neighborhood development. So it was one after another, after another, uh, we usually had two frames going at a time and, and, and he was cost conscious. I mean, it wasn't a, a nickel and dimer, but he was cost conscious. And we made like a handshake arrangement that any lumber that we could save building the house without changing anything structurally, that we would split it between him and us. And we were able at that time to shave about five to $600 worth of lumber out of the house, which doesn't sound like a lot today, but back then we were framing a house for about, it was about say a 2,500 square foot house. We'd frame it for about $6,000 and that included siding, roofing and windows. So, um, you know, that was an extra, you know, money in our pocket. So that was what really brought us to it. And were you using it continuously since then, or have you bounced back and forth? Pretty much. Once we started with that, we pretty much stuck with it. Um, okay. I mean, some, and the nice thing about advanced framing is a lot of different aspects to it. So you don't have to buy into the whole program. And right. there are some parts, I'm sure Tim picks off a few parts. I pick off a few parts and, uh, but you don't have to buy the whole thing hook, line and sinker. Right. It's not like a program you subscribe to. I mean, you can, it's sort of like a, a different way of thinking about how to frame and you can choose what makes sense to you. I've heard a lot of builders also dabbling in it. You know, you incorporate a few things at a time and kind of roll into it. Um, has that been your experience, Tim, or did you guys just decide one day we're starting? Um, Brian and I had been talking about it off and on when I, I mean, back in like 94 in my construction class, we went over the whole OVE thing and just to get introduced to it. Yep. And then I think it, it's been about three years for us that we just decided, why not? Let's just do it. Mm -hmm. and, and the only concern we had was how wavy were the walls going to end up being. So we thought, right. well, we could manage that with, you know, pick and choose your material type of thing. And so the first house we did just exterior walls, interior walls, and I think the floor were still 16 centers. And then the second house was like, why didn't we just go all in? So we did. And ever since. I think the first floor that we did that was designed 24 on center, Kyle and I could notice right away, especially blocking is where we mm -hmm. saved a lot of time. And it was like, okay, well, why don't we just keep designing around that? And then just to make everything stack, it was 24 on center from then on. And uh, to, to fill people in to, who don't know Tim, Brian's your brother who's the yes. you know, co-owner co yeah. of the company, right? Or Yeah, or yeah. So Pioneer Builders, end. yep. So we work for Pioneer Builders. It's a family company and, and Brian does all the stuff that requires brains. And I do all the stuff that requires brawn. <laughs> and Kyle helps you with the, with the brawn end of things. Yeah, and the style, mostly style. That's what he's yeah. there for. <laughs> um, so what do you guys think is a fair way to quickly summarize advanced framing? Is it, is it really just as simple as, hey, instead of 16 or 12 or 16 on center, you're framing 24 inches on center? Or, um, you know, to me, it incorporates uh, stacked framing and using, you know, eliminating anything that's extraneous. Um, what else would you guys add to that? That's just kind I'd, of a baseline. 
I'd say is getting rid of sticking with 24 on center mm -hmm. or, or if you're working on a different format, working on with that, um, but sticking with that, stacking everything up as much as possible and looking for all the lumber in the wall that does absolutely nothing structurally and adds nothing structurally that you don't need. Right. And then, um, and that's it. Just taking it out, whether it's headers, whether it's plates, whether it's studs, jacks, cripples, uh, and blocking. And, um, some of the some of the reasons why this has come about we mentioned earlier is uh, less money to go into the framing of the house you're going to save save a decent chunk on materials um, wood is not a very good insulator compared to insulation so the more the higher the ratio of the wall that you can free up for insulation the better performing that wall is going to be um, but Oh, and also you guys mentioned the, the labor savings, which was a question I had is, do you feel like it, it saves labor or that it, it ends up being more work or is it a wash? On the labor side? Yes. I don't think it makes that much of a difference. Yeah. I, I don't, I, a little bit, but not that much. I haven't found it made too much of a difference, but I've been doing it for almost 30 years. So I don't really remember. It was just a learning curve when we got over it. And after that, it was just... I don't think we've saved that much time. I don't know, Tim, both, did you, did you find both, you save any time when you moved to doing advanced framing, Tim? Yeah, not so much in the framing of walls. Um, you know, because we've got a forklift, so the studs are always close to where we're, we're actually put together the wall. So not there, but I, what I've noticed is the blocking. That's the big savings, and I just didn't anticipate that. But a bunch of blocks at 14 and 7 16ths versus 22 and 7 16ths, that you really do race through the wall a lot quicker. But I, I don't know, maybe I'd throw like five or 10% faster, probably 5%. We're already, we're already getting questions right off the bat. And, and um, one of them starts off with dumb question here, but so let me just say that there are no dumb questions here. This mm -hmm. is, you know, this is going to be new for a lot of people. Um, but the question is, does all 24 inch on center require using two by sixes? Um, and I know Mike has something to say about this. <laughs> yeah, it all depends. There's code issues with, with going uh, two by four. You can build a two by four building, uh, two by four walls, I should say, up to a one story building or the second floor, upper floor of a multi-story building, uh, as long as the building is 32 feet or narrower. Um, once you get beyond 32 feet from your bearing exterior walls or you get multi-level, two levels, uh, then you're going to have to use uh, two by sixes on the lower level. It also kicks in that you can't do a three level building where you've got 24 on center, two by sixes at the lowest level. Um, that would have to be at 16 on center rather than 24. Wait, now, I wanted, hold on. I want to just clarify that. Yeah. You're losing me a little bit on the, oh, I, can, can I do, because you said first floor, what's the concern? Is the concern is if you stack too many layers of two by fours, 24 on center, it's going to get flimsy. So the, 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 it really comes down to engineering. So the building code, if you're following strict IRC, it's all based on prescriptive. And for the most part, except for your corner shear panels, you're only required for most parts of the country, except where Tim is and where I am <laughs> in high wind or in seismic zones, you only need one four by eight sheet, essentially of sheathing on the exterior corners. Um, other than that, you don't need any sheathing. Now, if you're framing based on code, you're limited to a two by four stud. If you're going 24 on center, you're limited to a single story build. And the reason is because it does not presume sheathing across the entire wall. Oh, I see. So if you have an engineer involved, usually you can go around a lot of what's prescriptive in there as far as whether you can go two or three floors with two by sixes or more than one floor with two by fours at 24 on center. Gotcha. So there's, there's some things to know there. And you're saying it's from bearing wall to bearing wall. So in bearing a traditional, wall wall. so it might be from Eve to Eve and if it's um, mm -hmm. um, interesting, but there's no reason why you wouldn't be able to have um, advanced framing and have it be uh, a ridge beam and have it be uh, loaded on the gable ends, right? It doesn't have to be a simple structure necessarily. There's all kinds of things when you get outside of the IRC, when what you're just talking about there where you've got a ridge beam, now yep. you're outside of the IRC and the prescriptive measures because they only okay. address, they only address simple frame with, with uh, dimensional lumber. 
So, oh, really? I didn't know yeah. that. Okay. Yeah, you, you won't find eye joists and structural bridge beams and things like that in the in the IRC. So, Mike, I know that you did the the first home built fine home building house we built with you in 2015. 16, uh, yeah. 2016, it had a, a walkout basement, a first grade level floor, and then a second floor. Yep. So, three total floors. How did you tackle that from a framing point of view when using advanced framing? because of the wind zone that we're in and we had an engineer involved and he wanted 16 on center for that low level, the third level down, which was our walkout basement. He wanted it double plated only because when you move from a 16 on center format to a 24 on center format, you're not going to get your floor joist and your framing above that level stacked. So you have need the double plate in order to carry essentially the double plate acts as a miniature header between the two studs at 16. So when we had off center joists, they would be supported by the double top plate. Right. So then we and went with two by sixes above that. And, and we do have a question before. here from, uh, from Jack about um, when we're talking about stacking lumber, do we mean rafter above stud, above stud as you go through the building? And, and yeah, that is what stacked framing is about. And I think a lot of people don't realize that that double plate in addition to two ways to, you know, in addition to tying walls together is, as Mike said, it's sort of like a little mini header. I mean, it gives you that forgiveness so that your rafters don't have to land right on top of the studs. Um, but in when you're doing advanced framing, when you're going 24 on center and have a single plate, that is important. Um, but I believe you'd still have a little wiggle room, right? Is it is it one, one and a half inches either side or does it have to be dead on in your experience, guys? It, it's one inch from the side of the stud so you're from the from so you got two sides to the stud mm -hmm. you can be one inch off to the left and one inch off to the right on each stud okay um, and, but and, no and, more and the theory there for anybody this that is thinking about load paths is that it it basically is transferred into a triangle the load mm -hmm. so um it does still land on that stud yeah. or that joist or whatever it is and does that does this also apply for floors i mean can i have do, do I need to have my jo my studs lined up with my floor joists, even if it's going through a plate and sheathing first? Well, technically your rim board would be carrying the right. load through. So that's gonna do most of it. So generally you're not gonna have a problem if it's a little bit off, but there again, if you're going to stack it up, there's a lot of it other advantages for the trade contractors coming through later on and drilling holes. I like to just keep it all in line from top to bottom makes everybody else's life easier. And um, we uh, had a question on here from Peter that wondering how you guys, how this has changed, uh, how much you guys are seeing 19.2 inch stud layouts or floor, you know, framing layouts in general. Zero. Yeah, is anybody doing that anymore? <laughs> we did one eye joist floor years ago where that was a way to say <laughs> what, a joist every eight feet? Yeah. And it was such a hassle. It was like, nope, it's either 16 or 24. Yeah. Yep, yeah. same here. I did one house like that because the eye joist uh, supplier laid it out that way and we're like, this is not going to work. <laughs> this is yeah. not going to work. Um, we got a question a little bit earlier there it, and I read it says, uh, do the buildings last as long? Oh, yes. And before we get too far without addressing that, um, I, without anticipating what, what he really means by that, we can go back uh, over a hundred years or more and find houses that were built at 24, even wider spacing. Sure. Uh, timber and frames are four feet on frame, center, six balloon, feet on center. Or in a lot of the old balloon frames were at 24 mm -hmm. or 19.2 and they're all going fine right now. And a lot of those didn't have the same other building elements we usually build with today, like structural sheathing on the outside. They just had planks, mm -hmm. which offer some, racking resistance, but not a tremendous amount. Right. A lot of them had diagonal lead embracing. They had, yep. Um, but yeah. Tim, do you see a lot of old houses out where you are? No, you know, here in Washington, we do, but the majority is like 60s, 70s and later. Yeah. What's, what's the oldest 80s. house you've worked on out there? Oh man, we don't really do much remodeling. Um, I think there's a local kingdom hall that we helped remodel that I want to say was like 60 or 70 years old, but we just went and did some, you know, just minor stuff. Not like old. what's the oldest, what's the oldest house you've worked on, Mike? The oldest one? Yeah. Uh, 
God, it was the late 1600s. <laughs> I want to say 1685 or 1690, somewhere around there. That's nuts. Yeah. My next door anyway. neighbor, there's a house next door to me where I live that I, I, I actually owned for a little while. And it was built, built in 1735. And we, I remodeled that a couple times. It's just wild. I have to, I have to adjust. I, I forget that not everybody lives in New England. And when we say old houses, <laughs> it might be different for different people. Yeah. Um, okay. So not surprisingly, a lot of the comments that we're getting are about things that, um, that could be a hassle to deal with. So uh, let's just dive in and start going through them. Um, uh, let's see here. We, there's a there's a mention about siding. Um, there are going to be some siding install some siding manufacturers that want you to have your stud space 16 on center according to their instructions. Um, how do you guys get around that when you're putting your studs at 24 inches on center? We're fully sheathed, like Mike was saying. Our areas are very similar, so we have structural sheeting around the whole house. And our local LP rep walked, came by a couple weeks ago. I think APA has got a new guideline on nailing into structural sheathing. So it's nice with us because we're using the zip panels. So we know where all the framing is. Mm -hmm. And then you just shoot in between if you need to. And so even if they're claiming you have to, you have to get your fasten, I, I believe it's fiber cement, Mike. Is it hardy that you need to get into studs? I believe Mine, you're right. Yeah. You, measure, you memorize all those instructions. I, you know, I don't have enough storage capacity left in my brain to keep all that in, but that could be the case. What you'll find though is with an awful lot of the manufacturers, they have their basic instructions and then they know that houses are being built at 24 on center and they know if they don't address it somehow, then they lose part of the market. And, and a lot of the production builders have, have incorporated advanced framing just because if they can save, you know, $5 on every house and they're building, you know, 10,000 houses, they save a little bit of money and that adds up after a while. So the manufacturers of most siding products do have uh, sort of, uh, they have technical bulletins. So instead of a 6D nail at say 16 on center, you might have to use an 8D nail at 24 on center or something like that. So if mm -hmm. you check the instructions, you'll find most of the manufacturers that I've looked into all allow us to install at 24 on center without a problem. Okay. Um, I just wanted to show you guys in the audience something. We did an article about this, um, God, 15 years ago now. How about that? Um, but it had a really good visual. I'm just going to share my screen real quick so everybody can see this. Because um, I just wanted to show, oops. I just wanted to show real quick. This is a little, a little comparison right here of, if you can see this over on the left-hand side, can you see? You guys, you guys see that, Mike and mm -hmm. Tim? Yep. Um, this is a, a comparison of uh, what the wall would look like with 16 on center framing versus 24 inch on center framing. Mm -hmm. um, the purpose of this particular illustration was to show how much it will save you in terms of lumber, um, how much uh, how much it would cost you for annual heating and cooling because of the added insulation R value that kind of thing. But the reason I wanted to bring it up is I think it's just a pretty good all in one visual of the different parts and pieces that, um, that we're going to want to talk about. Um, we've already talked about the double top plate here in the standard wall versus a single top plate. Um, can we expand on that right now and, um, and talk about how you guys handle, uh, we talked about bearing, you know, that you have to be within one inch on either side of the framing member below it. How about when you guys are doing uh, partition walls or uh, how about when you're joining walls end to end for a long wall where you need to have a break in a plate? Um, do you have that over a stud? Do you use a piece of metal hardware? Um, and how are you tying in perpendicular walls? Is that ladder blocking or how do you guys tackle that? So let's do the plate first. Okay. T Tim, I haven't what I haven't seen you talk much about the, the plate and how you do it. it. How do you do plates? So you do double or are you doing single? Always double top plate for us. But, if, you know, here in earthquake country, there's just not enough advantage to try and make the engineer do that, go to, go to single and deal with straps and all that. So that's the one thing that I don't ever see us changing is away from the double top plate. Too many advantages. It, it, see, it seems like that's what I see most often is the, you know, a lot of, Mike, you mentioned that you can kind of pick and choose what you want to stick with when it comes to advanced framing. Yeah. That seems like the one that most people that I see don't bother trying to figure out as a single plate. 
Yeah, there's a lot of pushback. Not only do people feel that the walls are going to be wobbly uh, when they're trying to string them, but also there's a problem with the stud height. If you're taking a regular pre-cut stud for eight foot walls at 92 in whatever it is happens to be in your area, 92 and a half or five eighths, and you have a double top plate, now you got eight foot one or so for your overall height from subfloor to where your ceiling joists are gonna go. But if you go with a uh, single top plate, now that's gonna be too short. Um, so, you know, what do you do? Do you wanna spend the time and money to labor, si uh, labor wise to cut all your studs? Um, I, I still use a single top plate, but I go with a full eight foot stud, the original pre-cut. And then, <laughs> well, it was, you, you don't remember back when, when I started framing, we had to cut all our studs to length because they all had just these, you know, it was just cut out of a log. It could be, you know, eight foot six or nine foot long. It was just rough cut. Anyhow, the, um, what year was that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm only kidding. No, that was my, that was my grandfather's, uh, my, back in the uh, 18 and early 1900s before they trimmed them to length. But the, uh, an eight foot stud, I'll just throw that in and it gives me an overall of eight foot three. Mm -hmm. And then I just leave the gap at the bottom and not worry about the drywall being up a little bit and throw a little piece of either scrap drywall or plywood down at the bottom or OSB to fill for the baseboard. So. And I've seen, uh, I know other drywall contractors have preferred to have a very narrow rip right in the center of the wall where like, you know, at around that waist heights, too. they can make for easy finishing. Yeah. Um, so there's uh, different ways of dealing with it if you use an eight foot stud. It's Although, also worth noting, you've got 54 inch wide drywall sheets that you can use too could, to get yeah. out of that problem. Uh, those work better for the nine foot tall walls because otherwise right. you don't want to be cutting the sheets. It's just not, not fun doing a, long, a whole bunch of horizontal cuts. But then on the, as far as where you put the, if you do go with single top plate, you've got two options for how you join the place together. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not done over a stud. And that's the important thing. A lot of people get it wrong. Like I did the first time I put it over a stud. And but either you put a, a mending plate across it, which is just a, it's like a truss plate. You just drive some nails through it, but it ends up kicking up whatever's sitting on top of it by about an eighth of an inch. And not that that's a big deal, but if I don't have to do that, it's just easier. Um, so you actually break in the middle of a stud bay. So we just slap our plates down and not even think about where the, where the, where it ends. Uh, and we just make sure it breaks somewhere in the middle. So using a mending plates one way, the other way to do it is you just take a one solid block between the two adjacent studs and then you just nail it up from the bottom. So that's the other way to do it. Okay. And is that, is that second one you mentioned, is that something in the code or is that Oh, here it is. I'm looking right at an image of it. I'll have to, I'll have to share this so you guys can see it. I'd never heard that before. I didn't know you did that, Mike. Well, I usually use the mending plates because I find it easier, but you can do it with a block if you okay. don't have the plates around. And what it is, is there's a lot of guides out there. In fact, do you do show notes for these little expert session things? Like you do with the oh, podcast? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I, every, okay. this will, I should, I should mention that again. Thank you for reminding me. Findhomebuilding.com slash webinars is where you're going to find a recording of this. It should be up tomorrow. And we'll also have an opportunity to have uh, show notes. Yeah. It'll be basically a blog post. So, so there, there's a really good, like a little guide for advanced framing. I think it's put out by the APA and they got a lot of good illustrations and it's all code compliant stuff. It basically parallels what's in the code. So you can use that as a good guide it'll support a lot of the things that we're talking about today. Right. Okay. And um, I'm just going to share my screen again real quick so I can show you guys this. Um, I can show you guys my excellent Googling skills um, where I quickly pulled up the, an image of what Mike's talking about because I had never heard of this before. Um, oh, yeah. There you go. That's it. Yep. So you're looking at... Um, we have the single top. Is that what do I have up there? A single top plate right now? Yep. Single top got, plate with the block. That's and, your building um, science. Yeah. So <laughs> this is another a great, let's talk about load paths, um, especially where they can get more complicated. I mean, I think it's pretty easy to understand stud, 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 straight down. Um, what are you guys doing when you have uh, a beam that you need to handle? Uh, is it just... Do you have to go back to your engineer and, um, you know, do you find that you get a hassle from them in terms of how many jacks they want under something? Um, 
you know, it, it, there, we, we've all seen the walls that a typical, I don't want to say typical framer, but a typical framer will have where, um, you know, they're, they're framing in such a way, they're framing it to make it easy for themselves to frame a wall. So they're cutting the jacks, they're cutting, or sorry, they're cutting the, the sill supports, they're cutting the jacks, they're cutting the kings, and they're stacking them all up so you get three studs side by side, basically, for a window opening. Um, what are you guys doing that's different than that? Um, are you using header hangers? Are you using, um, for, let's, let's talk about around windows, load-bearing windows. I mean, the first and obvious is, um, question is, are you eliminating headers for all but the essential bearing openings, or are you keeping head headers in the, in all openings to make your life easy? Tim, let's ask you first. Yeah, we're um, so I'm fortunate because the framer that taught me, it was always the mindset was remove everything you don't need. Right. And I was taught, I was forced to hand nail. So I really appreciated that because it meant a whole lot less um, hassle. Our engineers of the same mindset. So we're still using headers. Um, I think this next house will be just like um, inch and three quarter LVL, nine and a half. And then like in that wall that you're looking at, most of those headers aren't structural. Um, in fact, none of them are structural, if I recall, except maybe that bottom left. But we just put them in because it was easier. The uh, inspectors will sometimes push back and that's just not a battle that we've felt like we want to fight yet. But now that we're having the, in the houses fully engineered, then Terry can just put on there, our engineer, and no one can argue with it. Wait, so did I just contradict what you're saying when you said that you don't use any lumber that you don't need? And then I pulled up a picture that shows you using lumber you don't need? A or... little bit. <laughs> so, you know, and so this is the flip side of that, Justin, is that you could have, this is like real world experience. I've had inspectors literally scream in my face when I showed them paperwork. And so that's a battle that you have to weigh as the builder is like, is that worth spending all the time and money to, to deal with it? Or like in this case, to be transparent too, I forget the name of the company. Those were, I think, inch and a quarter um, LVLs with foam in between them. They wanted us to try them out. So essentially it was like, just put them all in, tell us what you thought. Mm -hmm. In those rake walls, most of those headers along those raked plates aren't needed. So mm -hmm. we can get away with it in certain jurisdictions where we know the inspectors well and they know us. And then whenever we get that new guy, we, you know, we play that game. And are you guys finding that you're getting much, I guess, you guys both self-perform the whole house, right? So you guys are the ones doing framing and finish? Not finish for me, but we do the framing, foundation, all the structural stuff we do. Okay. So when you pass off the house to a finished carpenter, uh, let's say to the, to the, everybody, the mechanical guys, the, the, the insulators, the drywall, the trim guys, what, what, what kind of feedback are you getting from them in terms of, dealing with 24 on center versus 16. So for us, we've got this Canadian finished carpenter that is the nicest guy. And that was my big concern. Is like, we're leaving everything out that we can. And we always make sure that there's enough backing and things for the drywaller. How's that gonna affect when he goes and hangs cabinets? Right. And so we talked to him, he, he, the way he screws his cabinets together and glues them to the wall, he's like, don't even worry about me. So we don't. Okay, that's not fair. What about the rest no. of the world? He's so easy. He's so easy. <laughs> um, I, I mean, cabinets is a good example because I, I know that a lot of people consider it um, j I mean, pretty much essential that you have continuous solid blocking where you're planning on putting kitchen cabinets or other built-ins just because it's the, the odds of you getting the fastening you want for your cabinets when you're 24 on center gets a lot harder. Um, this conversation gets tougher because Mike, you're going to put solid blocking behind it, no matter what you do. So, um, well, most of the kitchens I've done in the last few projects have all been on, most of the cabinets have been on interior walls. So it wasn't really an issue. I should have picked some builders who were, who were not doing a good job for this webinar because <laughs> you guys are already doing everything. Um, Oh, you mean so you could have some controversy and some pushback between, oh, I would never do that. <laughs> well, I find myself thinking, well, what would you do in the case of kitchen cabinets? And your answer is going to be, well, I'm going to do it the right way. Like I've done it for 30 years. Um, uh, or I'm going to hire a Canadian who's, who's never going to be mean ever because he's Canadian. Uh, but uh, same thing for drywall guys. I'm ready. Are you guys doing for your advanced frames? Are you doing um, drywall clips in the, in the inside corners or are you doing solid blocking? 
Yeah, so this is where, you know, it's a little bit of a misnomer, the advanced framing for us is that we're still putting, you know, that's where we use up all of our scrap wood. Okay. You know, it, mm -hmm. it's either throw out the trash or take it home. I can, in fact, I still have wood from last year that I was using for campfire. So I don't need any more wood. So we use it all up in the corners. Um, blocking for cabinets. What I do find with 24 centers is I think the other big thing everybody wonders about is how wavy do the walls get? Right. And we figured that one out right away. Exterior walls, not really noticeable. But when they come in with a solid surface and there's any kind of, so I always let in, you know, as we're going at the cabinet height, then I'll let in a two by six and try to flatten that all out. Okay. I don't do it in bathrooms, pretty much just the kitchen. What about for straightening exterior walls? You guys are both in the camp of tipping up walls with the sheathing already on them for the most part, or are you doing some of both ways? You know, you're you you, lift walls without sheathing them first, Mike. I've, I've never done it, but I know they do it in some parts yeah. of the country. Yeah. When I worked in Texas, they would lift all the walls up, then they'd rack them, and then they'd put the sheathing on. I was like, okay. <laughs> Just different way to doing it. Um, has it changed when you guys are, are straightening? Do you have any advice for people who are switching to 24 on center in terms of what they need to watch out for when straightening that kind of a wall versus what they're used to? More bracing, less bracing, faster, slower? <laughs> Pick, pick your plate stock just like you ordinarily do. Yep. I usually put my, I use uh, adjustable braces and I usually space them anywhere from 10 to 12 feet apart. And that's usually adequate till we drop the joist or the rafters on. No, no problem with single top plate. So, okay. You know, you were, there could be an advantage is if you're not being that picky with top plates, it is easier to push a single top plate than it is a double top plate in some cases. You know, there's, there's times, honestly, we're, we really cheat. We, we try to use our muscles as little as possible. So if a wall needs to push or pull, we use the forklift and we just go and set braces. But a single top plate, you would be able to do that all by hand really easily. So I, I don't see that as being something. And for us, though, I, I should say, Justin, for the guys that don't know, because we try to lift as big a walls as we can, that's where we're putting in the double top plate and things. Is to, we need that wall to be nice and stiff as we lift it. Right. And you're using so, mostly a lull when you're lifting things when you're, your cruise, right? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about the lead in two by six? Are you, so you're putting, you're letting it in on the flat. Uh, Correct. And, yep. and is it horizontal or diagonal? Um, horizontal. So if your cabinet height, you know, was let's say 36 and a half inches centered, that I'll just center a two by six, you know, flat against the wall and I'll just let it in inch and a half and nail them. And then I'll go and I'll eyeball down the wall and see if I need to adjust that at all. And okay. it just makes that, that solid surface backsplash look a lot better. Okay. Yep. Um, I would imagine the same, same thing's going to be happening in, in bathrooms. If you have a, a bathroom with a long wall and playing on tile, um, yeah. are there situations where you guys will switch to 16 on center, on, you know, for one part of a build just to avoid problems? Yeah. If it's like a big tile bathroom, like um shower, I, I think last time I read, I think even though the code lets us structurally do 24, I think the tile backer, they wanted 16. And, and, I'll, and I'll be totally transparent. I always forget that. And then we end up throwing a couple more studs in. So the spacing looks like it's 12 inches. <laughs> and so I'm always just like, ah, oh, kind of ruined the whole purpose here. But it was only two more studs. So, um, And are you guys, you guys are going 24 inch on center for your floors as well, correct? Um, okay, so that and using both, en both using engineered lumber for the most part at this point? We're mostly sawn on the main floor and then engineered as we go up. Okay. And how are you guys addressing the bouncy floor issue? We don't have, I don't know about you, Mike. We're, we're not, this is the challenge that I always put to people who are asking questions. You come through and I'll take you through 10 houses and then you write on a piece of paper what you thought the spacing was. <laughs> yep. And I guarantee you they'll be wrong. Yep. Is, I think right. <laughs> is it because you're using thicker sheathing or no. you're planning bearing walls differently? Or no. is it just, it's just a, just a kind of a myth. Both. I think for us, what, what, um, and we're still using three quarter inch sheathing. So we're not mm -hmm. finding any of the flex, but when you get the drywall underneath it, so if you're talking second floor, you're not, that helps to stiffen it. And then of course we always make sure that we have something underneath our walls, uh, solid. And then on the main floor, since we're usually over crawl spaces, we've got girders every 10 feet. So that provides, none of the spans are long. Um, Leon put in a question. Can you guys explain the difference between sawn and engineered lumber? Um, and I'm, and I'm using engineered pretty broadly. There's a lot under that umbrella. So, so sawn for us, that's our engineer's term. Sawn is two by eight, two by 10, two by 12. 
and then engineered as I Joyce or Trust Joyce. Mm -hmm. I Joyce or Trust Joyce. Well, or Trust Joyce or I Joyce, I guess is it's like Kleenex of the. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I talked to the warehouser guys, and they're, they're always a little bit bitter because they were the original Trust Joyce. Yeah. But by Trust Joyce, I mean like Open Web, I guess. Probably. Okay. Op open Web Floor yeah. Trusses. Okay. Yep. yep. This is one of those things people like to say TG TGIs too, even though that's not even a real thing. TJIs, and that's one brand. But anyway, um, uh, any other questions, guys? Just to remind you, you can put them over over in the in the uh, either the chat or the Q and A box. Um, we had a question about um, uh, to you know to tag on to that the backing and nailing topic that we talked about for drywall. Um, do you have any issues with the clabberts looking, the siding looking wavy? And I mean, we talked about fastening, but I have heard that complaint that, you know, it can look, it can, it, it can look a little wavier to the eye in certain situations. We do a little bit, but what it, I would do the same test is you're going to, especially with Hardy, it telegraphs more so than the LP. And there's always going to be some, even though we're crowning studs, whether it's 16 or 24 on centers, we're not really seeing a difference between the two. And then since we're balloon framing our, most of our, our big walls, anytime I need to get above about 16 foot, I'm gonna order LSL to get the extra length and that's gonna help keep it nice and flat too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you guys seeing, um, is there anything to worry about in terms of, uh, or any advantage to running your wall sheathing horizontal versus vertical in terms of helping to flatten things out visually? I couldn't comment because we, we won't do that. Because because we have to block all panel seams, if we start running horizontally, we're automatically doubling or more the amount of blocking that we need. So okay. our, you know, we've talked to our engineer much about that. The benefits of going horizontal and blocking, we can easily make up for with either a bigger nail or tighter nailing spacing. So there's no advantage to that uh, realistically. I, I hear that from people and that's one, I just don't think, Mike, you probably would know better than me. I don't feel like 716 zip panels are gonna help flatten out on 24 centers if we go horizontal. But no, it's not going to make a difference. No, nope. yeah. it's not going to make a difference. And you can carry that same thing to the to the drywall on the inside. You know, first when we started doing it, the drywall guys, well, here it's it's veneer plaster, and they would say, "Oh, we're going to get all kinds of waviness in the wall." And I'm like, "But my studs are straight; they're all in line. It shouldn't make a difference." And these guys were all residential guys. When you move into commercial work, which is where I learned a lot of the 24 on center practices where we were just using steel studs and track down long, long, long walls. Those drywall hangers weren't having any problems with flat walls. So it's really the framing rather than the, the, uh, the spacing. And that would be the same whether we're running the drywall vertical or the sheathing vertical or we're running them horizontal. It's really not okay. that much of a difference. And Mike, we, let's circle back to the drywall question for you is what are you doing on inside corners for your, for your wall board? So if it's an exterior outside corner, so it's, you know, on the exterior, generally I'll just use, do a two stud corner mm -hmm. and I usually take scraps and it might be the same thing you're doing, Tim. And I just rip whatever comes out of the windows and just put a little strip down on the inside just to give some backing for the drywall guy. It's just simple. It's cheap. Gets rid of the scrap. I don't have to go bring it to the dumpster. And then uh, for any interior, where any interior petitions meet an exterior wall, um, I leave a about a three quarter of an inch gap. And I don't put any framing in that inside corner. I run all the exterior drywall, goes straight through, just an, another uh, commercial construction framing technique. You let all the sheets of drywall run through, purposely break them in the middle of a stud bay. And we can talk about Myron. You should do a whole one of these webinars about the best way to practices for getting good flat walls with drywall. Break it in the middle of a stud bay, put a drywall backer strip on there so you cave in the butt joint and that way it looks flat when it's finished. And that way you end up using less drywall. And when you bring in the, sh the, uh, the, the drywall from the partition wall, it just butts that exterior wall, you tape it, and you could hit that with a, with a bulldozer and it really doesn't move. Well, maybe not a bulldozer. It'll move when <laughs> I hit it with a dozer. Um, and now, let's see here. Okay, let's talk about header hangers versus trimmers around windows. I, I, I started down this path and then I, I took us off. Yeah, you jumped direction. around. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. That's um, right. Which way do you guys go? Or have you tried both ways? Um, what advice do you have for people who are considering this shift? We haven't done the header hangers. We're, um, we're still trimmers. Especially, I think, because balloon framed walls. It's just a lot easier for us just to stay in that process. Mike. Although it, though it's not something that is, so the advanced framing techniques in and of themselves are pretty much sticking with the 24 on center format and then everything else is conventional, like conventional headers and conventional mm -hmm. roof framing and so on. But you can take the advanced framing purpose, which nowadays is to get more insulation in cavities and get ex, you know, extra wood out of the walls you don't need. So I pretty much eliminate any header I don't need. Tim talked about, um, you know, on the exterior non-bearing walls, you know, you could just put a flat two by there. You don't really need a structural header unless you're in certain wind zones or seismic zones where it might be necessary. So it's right in the code book. If there's, if it's a non-bearing wall, no header. I just skip it. Now there's some conditions on that. I don't think we want to get into the details on that, where the distance off the top plate and the width of the opening. But even in those cases, you can minimize the amount of headers that you actually need. Then right sizing the header instead of just taking what I learned when I was a young framer, it's double two by 12 jammed up to the bottom of a top plate and then cripple down from or jack down from there or trimmer down from there. Um, sizing the header, whether, you know, a lot of openings, you may only need a double two by four uh, to do it, or maybe even a single two by six. So you can really shave down the amount of lumber that goes in as your header. But I, I've moved towards at least on two story buildings. Uh, I exclusively for the second floor, which would be the supporting uh, the, the first floor walls would be supporting the second floor. I don't put any structural headers in my first floor, my lower floor. I put them in the floor system. So already we're running a rim joist around. And in many cases, whether that's a dimensional lumber rim joist or whether it's an engineered rim joist, you know, like a strand board or an LVL board, those all have ratings from either the manufacturer or for dimensional lumber from the, the header table in the code. And just by throwing in one or two joist hangers where any floor joist that meets that rim board over an opening, we can eliminate the structural header. You already got that rim joist up there. Why not right. take advantage? Right. Um, and then uh, box headers is my other go-to. We're already putting sheathing on the walls. Now, though the code requires, if you're doing it, following the code tables that we have 15, 30 seconds rather than seven sixteenths. So it's got to be a 32nd of an inch thicker, which you can buy. You can just, it, most lumber yards will stock that. It's like an extra buck sheet. And I'll just drop those sheets over the areas where we've got some, uh, where we, where we want to do a box header. And you can span in many cases up to four foot wide openings with just a box header, basically just a sheathing over the, a, a flat header board, with the top plate above it, and then the cripple studs in between, and then you just nail it at a three inch pattern. And that's all outlined in the code book and in a, a installation guide. So skip all the headers you can. Some people okay. think I'm nuts doing that, but you know, that's <laughs> Well, okay. I mean, I, I've always wondered why more people don't, and this is sort of a side topic, but more people don't use the rim joist as a header, either mm -hmm. double up the rim and they just skip all the headers in the wall that you yep. can, or it, it seems like, I don't know what the downside would be to that aside from you don't have as much room to insulate in, in the rim joist area, but I could comment on that, Justin. Let's, let's hear it. It's the production mentality we have as framers is yeah. I don't want to put a header on top of the wall because now I've got a nail hangers and that means my joists aren't the same length as the other. If I can, you know, cause I'm going to cut a lot of these with a chainsaw. If I have 20 or 30 joists that are exactly the same length, I can cut them. We can throw them up and keep rolling when we're framing walls. We can cut all of our headers the same at the same time. And so it's all that speed that you pick up. Yeah, but I'm talking about two by six walls with a double rim. So all of your joists are still the same length because the rim. Oh, I see. You're saying the whole house. Yeah. And, I'm, and you still have enough bearing on that top plate that you don't need hangers. Right? I guess for me, my first thought hearing that is if I doubled up all of the rim, or at least on the, the bearing side, I'm kind of eliminating the advantage of taking wood out of the wall. Right. Yeah, right. That, that is true. Rim. How do you not have enough bearing, Mike? You have two and a half inches. Yeah, but you, you know, you, you need the hanger. You're not going to get away from the hanger because you, you've, yeah. You, but what is the plate bearing on now? The now you got the, you've got that rim joist. You got the plate under it, and if you rest the joist on just that little two inches of plate that's left over, it's going to drop. 
<laughs> so you right, need the hanger there into the rim to support the joist. Even, even if it's over a stud. Oh, no, not over a stud. Yeah, no, 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 I'm no, no. About stacked, yeah. Oh, oh, I thought you were talking about over an opening. Sorry. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah you but guys can't no, read my mind? No, uh, not accurately. <laughs> I'm with Tim, though. There's no point in doubling up the rim joist around the perimeter. And where, we um, do need, where I do need a double rim in order to support o over an opening, support floor joist, and I just throw an extra layer in there. It's pretty simple. And cutting them a different length, I'm, most of mine, so I'm not necessarily always using eye joists where you wouldn't need to trim all of them the same. Um, where at, or you have to trim them to fit. If I'm using dimensional lumber and it's going over a, a center bearing partition, then there's usually a little overlap. So you've got a little wiggle room there. So, you know, it's a little bit of a learning curve. And, and, and if you're into production and you've got your system, a lot of these advanced framing techniques, you know, people find them hard to integrate. But, you know, if you figure out a way to make it work, and my brother and I, you know, been doing it for years, and it's just the two of us for the most part, along with the helper, and we just are used to doing what we got to do. That's another topic we could dig into for a future, future session, Mike, is the uh, headers for, for every occasion. Mm -hmm. That's a good got point. Yep. Lots of those. Can you, before we move off the headers, can you just touch real quickly on, if you know off the top of your head, how far a single uh, two by four on the flat at the top of your window opening can span before you get into trouble or you need to add, you need to flip it on edge or. So if you're less than eight feet, yeah. If your opening is less than eight feet wide between mm -hmm. your Kings. And as long as you have at least or, or less than 24 inches from the top plate to the bottom of the header board, then you don't need any structural header in a non bearing wall. Okay. Once you get beyond that, the code doesn't tell us what to do. It just says you need a header. And so I don't know what to do. I just shrug my shoulders. Uh, um, we have some people saying that hangers are a must at the openings. That was probably in response to me and not to the, to the, uh, to the header hangers we're talking about. But uh, on, a note on those header hangers, um, the ones I'm familiar with are the Simpson, I think they're HH4 and HH6. Wow, you know numbers. <laughs> well, because it's because it's header hanger H H. Oh, uh, they make I would have never noticed that. They make things for stupid people like me. Can't remember. Um, and I actually have used those on a project. I the work that I did was limited to remodeling. You guys don't want me on a new house build. I would be too slow for you. But um, but I use them because I didn't have room to get trimmers in on a remodel. Um, and there are some things to know. I, I think technically you can't, and somebody in the audience might be able to call me out on this, but from my recollection is that um, the literature from Simpson says that you need to have a four by four. I think it needs to be, uh, I, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, because it needs to be three and a half inches, I think, wow. of meat for that hanger to, to bear on. So two stud, uh, so what's I'm not even point? sure. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not, that was, that's where I was at of what's the point. Um, I've used header hangers once and I said, nah, I'll throw the trimmer in. It's just not right. worth the trouble. Right. It, it, yeah. it, that, that is a place where you can get screwed up with, with putting trim around the window too, because you got a big metal block in the corners where you need to be fast. Especially where the miter joint's going to be. Yeah. And, it, and, it's, and it's a good wide flange on there. So you're back four inches or five inches. So It is. Yeah. And it's, it's thick too. Yeah. Um, Oh, Ar Armando's here. He, Armando Cobo told me that they're, they're called HH for hurricane headers. So maybe I'm wrong. The one thing I knew, I got, I got I that know. wrong. Um, hurricane hangers. I don't think so. Uh, and I am being told that they can be used on a single two by, um, the, okay. I'll have to look that up because the literature back when I did, it was the diagram did not include that. Um, somebody was telling me too on here that they eliminate trimmers by notching studs. Have you guys ever heard of that? I've done that on a remodel when we had to put in a full frame window in an old house and didn't want to rip the whole house apart and we just notched right. in, but no, you need a minimum of inch and a half. In fact, if, if, mo if anybody really looked at the header tables, a lot of frame, the codes have changed in the last few years. The number of jacks that you've got to put, I, I, there's one condition where I found um, you would, if you had a two foot, two inch wide opening and you put a header above it in a certain condition, you need double trimmers. To right. support that header. So a lot of times people just think, oh, I'll just put a single jack in. Um, and that's enough for, you know, almost any size header. 
So getting back to your point or the, the question, no, you can't notch into your king in order to support your header. Right. You need a minimum of an inch and a half. But, yeah, no, no. Sorry, Mike. But if you had an engineer who let you do that, then let them put their stamp on it. What I was going to say is I, I've never understood the try to save a cripple by breaking your trimmer above and below the cell. Our engineers always like, there's a kind of a general rule for however big your opening is, is how many times you need to double the king for high wind. And especially as we get taller and taller walls. So if you, to me, you run your trimmers or jacks continuous and butt the cells to them. And then, cause that does help provide stiffness when it's all nailed together. And then one thing we can't do necessarily is eliminate the double king. And especially as we go taller and taller, that's, that really provides stiffness to our walls. And, the, uh, um, by the way, the uh, strong tie, it is header hanger. And they're three and 11 sixteenths by whatever the width of the wall is. So they're not a small, not a small um, hanger. I was right. You were correct, yep. <laughs> but somebody, somebody pointed out here that you could use them on a single two by. Did, you didn't see anything about that, Tim, when you were looking at it? Um, I, can, I can look at the um, catalog page. I find that the Simpson catalog is so much easier to use online. Um, <laughs> I've never tried it know. any other way. <laughs> Yeah, the, the code, you know, we used to, well, I won't tell that story. I used to always tell the guys, we'll just leave one in the uh, Santa can. And when you're, when you have time, just read through the catalog. It never works. And, and when you run out of toilet paper, you've got something to use. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. In their picture, a typical header hanger installation, it nails to just the trimmer and then the, um, you want me to actually, can I yeah, share, share your screen? screen? Yeah. Pop it on there. Cause I'm curious to, to go down this rabbit hole. Um, cause I don't know anybody who uses these. Um, I know that they were kind of the thing that everyone talked about as, oh, you don't need, you can save lumber by using these things. Um, okay. Yeah. So they're showing it as a, a double two by. Yeah, basically. So it's a double, double, um, double king. Just a double king. Yeah. And it Three just nails into one of them. 16s. Yeah. Okay, cool. So somebody asked a question to explain balloon framing. This was a little while ago. Do you want to do a little sidebar on balloon framing? Sure. Do we have you an illustration of that? Yeah, yeah we've got a picture. Yeah. That oh, Tim's great. got one. Yeah. Let me see. I'll, let me throw it up on my screen here real quick. Mike, you can get started and I will, uh, I will dig it up. Because Tim, you, you use balloon framing essentially for all your, your gable end or your rake walls. And you pretty much run studs all the way from your first floor floor deck all the way up to the ridge, right? To the underside all, of the ridge. Underside of the rafters, yeah. Yeah. And so it's a technique that's been around for, well, it was, I think it started in the early 1800s, like 1820, 1830, when uh, water-driven sawmills became more popular or more available. So you could cut the lumber into smaller pieces. And back then, you know, the trees grew bigger and, you know, old growth lumber, they could cut 30 and 40 foot long studs. And because they weren't, bringing them very far by tractor trailer truck, you know, it was all on farm carts. They could haul a 20 or 30 foot stud. So balloon framing, you got your foundation and you just put a, a timber sill there and you run these studs that went all the way up to whatever your top of your uppermost wall would be where your rafters would sit. And then you would let in a ledger, which is basically a, a one by six or one by four. You notch that into your studs like the illustration shows. And then, the, uh, the floor joists would sit on top of that. And if you look at some of the, the illustrations that you see in a, a lot of the uh, books on, on, you know, old framing practices, you'll see there are no structural headers on either bearing wall and non-bearing wall because that ledger essentially acted as a header. And most windows weren't big windows anyway. They're only putting in two, three, maybe four foot wide windows. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, there was, which is, and because those studs went all the way from the basement or foundation all the way up to the rafters, which is why these houses were very prone to, to burning. Whenever there's a fire in these, they just go up like crazy because those were just big cavities for, for there was no insulation in the walls, of course. Um, and it wasn't until the, I want to say the early 1900s when they started putting masonry block in bricks or whatever as fire yep. stopping and blocking. Um, I've worked on dozens and dozens and dozens of those old places, and it's always fun to tear those apart and, and see what the how they built those old buildings. I just also, you've used it modern in modern times, Mike. I mean, I, I, you yeah. used it for your garage, right? I mean, you used it to avoid a hinge point 
for uh, one and a half stories, right? In, in my house where I'm sitting right now, I've got two story balloon frame walls yep. uh, on the bearing side. Yep. And I think works. it makes a lot of sense still. I, mean, I know uh, Tim Beeble, who's a, who, who's a builder in Vermont doing a lot of, he did a lot of uh, net zero houses and really kind of rethought how to do a lot of things in a smart way. And he, he did double stud balloon frame walls. That was his, his oh, way right, right. of, sure. of, of uh, getting continuous insulation. And it was really slick. I, I still consider it to be one of the, one of the slickest walls. Mm -hmm. It's smart from a lot of different angles. So you guys can check out that article. Um, another reminder to go to findhomebuilding.com slash webinars. If you, if you, you're going to have to rewatch this whole program. So you remember all the different articles you're going to have to throw in the show notes. And I'll make somebody else do it. Okay. <laughs> um, so let's see. I'm looking, I will look back at my notes here. I got, a, got us off on a tangent. Um, That's okay. Uh, let's talk about how to sell customers on this because I know one thing uh, I can imagine you're, you're in a neighborhood where houses are going up. Um, everybody's framing 16 on center and you're framing 24 on center. Um, have you guys come into any situations where it's like, well, that looks cheap. How come, how come you're not using enough wood? You know, and my, my dad used to have the saying, when in doubt, build it stout, <laughs> you know, um, you haven't run into any problems like that in terms of. No, in our case, Justin, my brother, Brian, he's gotten so good at explaining, so good at explaining like the mechanicals and the building science stuff. I mean, you know, you follow, mm -hmm. he really goes down the rabbit hole, but he's really good at teaching it. So he'll comment on that. And then on the structural side is we just have the engineer design it so that we put in there what we need and nothing more. But one right. thing that we have noticed is like the local electrical inspector, inspector that comes out for Washington state. And we've had customers and we've had other, other people come out and they always comment that our houses feel stouter than the house down the street. Really? But yeah, as an example, there's a, a, a huge builder here in Washington that their trusses are made of two by threes I knew a guy that worked for them and they value engineer, but I think that's not really the correct term. Everything down to its minimum. And I had a friend that lived in one of those houses, the floor squeaked like crazy, everything bounced. And so when, when you compare us to them, even though we're 24 on center, if whatever it is that they're skipping, that's what gets right. noticed. Right. Well, I mean, there's, I mean, we certainly have, uh, you know, on the podcast and other places in the magazine for Q and a section, we've, we've gotten the, the bouncy floor thing. Mike, you know, I, we did that article years ago on yeah. solutions for a bouncy floor. And often it's um, you could be perfectly acceptable by a code standard, but from a comfort standpoint, it, you know, it still can feel off. Yeah, it's a little um, unsettling when the floor starts moving <laughs> beneath your feet. Yeah. Yep. And I think a lot of it has to do with the choice of materials. You know, and I know, Tim, you use, you know, sheathing products, both for floors and walls that are, are uh, you know, above a generic grade. And that makes such a difference in the way a floor feels. And I think it's the same with wall sheathing or roof sheathing for that matter. Mm -hmm. um, so just making those selections. So where I end up saving money on just the, the, the lumber that goes into walls and floors um, I'm going to spend that somewhere else, actually. It's not a net savings overall because I'm going to spend a little bit more on my sheathing, not because I'm going 24 on center necessarily, but just because I feel I get better performance out of it and I'm going to, you know, better nailing for hardwood flooring, uh, less deflection for tile work and floors, uh, and less telegraphing through roof sheathing. You know, rather than going with 7 16ths with H clips, you know, I'm going to go with 5 8 T and G up on the roof. So it's just a matter of choices there. I was just going to ask you about roof sheathing. So you are using five eighths um, and that's, so that's not a regional thing for you in terms of you need to hit high wind and block seams and things. Um, people should know that if they're going to do 24 on center for rafters and they want to stick with seven sixteenths roof sheathing, they need to use plywood clips. Is that correct? I think so. I don't even that, that know. That was my understanding of it too. I, I've Actually, always done them. Hmm? Yeah, we've always done the ply clips on 7 sixteenths. Yeah. And I don't know if that is code or not. I've never I seen it in the code. Hmm. I'm going to have to go look it up now. I can say, though, we, I mean, it's funny because with the, uh, back in the day being on fine home building and JLC's forums and now with Instagram, is for some people, they can't imagine framing 24 on center on the roof and using 7 sixteenths sheeting. Right. Well, that's been the way it's been here since the 80s. And the guy that taught me, they used to put three-eighths plywood on their roofs. And he's like, 
you were taught in the 70s, you only walked on trusses or you could punch through it. We, I mean, I'll, I'll go back to those houses that we built 25, 30 years ago, and there's no telegraphing. So I think that's, if it's just simply that our OSB, which we use, we won't use plywood almost ever here. It doesn't do very well in the rain. Uh, OSB does really well. If it's just stiffer and better made, I know. And that, that expression, Justin, I can tell. Yeah, that's opposite of what everyone says. Yeah. So we used to use plywood for our overhangs and then OSB in the field. And then it would rain and we'd come back the next day and have to rip off the plywood because it delaminated and bubbled. And we're like, hey, we're done. So now everything's closed soffits with LP on soffit board, which just is rock solid. Hmm. Because it's not the old five ply stuff. It's this kind of cheaper three ply stuff now. And right. It's faster growing wood. So it just doesn't hold up that well. Right. Well, I think the, the days of plywood are somewhat <laughs> numbered comparatively, right? Um, at, least for, at least on the framing side of things, yeah. Right, exactly. Um, we had a question, um, any issues for attaching rain screen or exterior insulation um, or something like heavy cladding when you're talking about 24 on center wall? Uh, I don't know of any. Um, well, I've been, I, the, uh, I, when we build uh, the, the fine home building house in 2016-17, uh, it was 24 on center, two inches of rock wool, rock wool on the outside with uh, one by three furring strips screwed on to give us a, a fastening base. And then we put on a Boral True exterior, which is not a true, it's not a fiber cement, but it's a fly ash product, but it's heavy like a fiber cement. Right. And then part of it, we also installed um, uh, some uh, adhered stone. So we put, a, we put mesh over it. We put a, a scratch coat uh, of uh, mortar on that. And then we adhered the stone. So those were some he pretty heavy things and no issue with 24. Right. Yeah, Tim, can you talk? Can you talk about Tim when when you switch between uh, dimensional lumber and engineered for for your framing? I mean, I know I know the photo we just showed um, you, you mentioned was because a company asked you to use that lumber, right? Oh, for the headers, yeah. No, I mean just in general. Um, and we're talking like balloon frame walls, floors, or what? I, I mean, sure. Let's go. Let's go with walls. So because. I can actually order 24, at least 24 foot long two by six, but I don't really want to order 20 foot long two by six, you know, <laughs> I mean, for obvious reasons, it's not going to be the prettiest. So anytime I get above, I'll say 20 feet, 16 to 20 feet, depending on what the wall is, that's when I'll switch over to an engineered wood like LSL studs, which I hate with a passion because they're so dense. It's hard on the guns. The nails tend to shear off. LPs is the worst. Um, uh, warehousers is a little bit better. So we try to specify that, but now you've got an engineered wood that is dead straight and I can order it. You know, I think I can order those at 40 feet long. I've never built a wall that tall. We're always 30 feet or less. So that's easily sourced. I know I, I ask because I know a lot of builders are not fans of the engineered lumber. And I think your answer was pretty good. It summed up why. <laughs> Yeah. And, and you know, I, the other thing I would just always throw out there now when it's when because I, I hear a lot of really disparaging comments about OSB. And as you as you know, the community saw we built a house over the winter that was the wettest that we've had a house get. And, and we actually had a few people on Instagram reach out really concerned about mold. That house is as dry. You would never know it wasn't built in the summer if you went over there right now. It's all shut down. So it's still in stud state. I mean, you can walk around. The edge gold from Warehouser, which is the mid-grade subfloor, the gaps are exactly the way that they were when we installed it. And it got snowed on, rained on, it sat underwater for three months. Um, we've used different products from all these manufacturers and they all do really well. So we have zero reservations about using engineered wood because of the weather. iJoyce hold up, OSB holds up, the LSL studs hold up, um, LVL beams, glue lambs, everything holds up really well. So I kind of feel like they've got that figured out. It's not like the, those early days when things really got squirrely. Cool. Um, what am I forgetting to What am I forgetting to talk about here? Tim, do you do uh, for your interior partition framing? Do you frame those at twenty four, or are you framing those at sixteen? Everything is twenty four. Okay. Yeah, everything's twenty four except for the shower walls that I forget. <laughs> then those are sixteen. Yeah. So I do the same thing. So a lot of people forget about carrying that same 24 through, not only on the exterior walls, they think they're doing it for energy and then they'll drop down to 16. But I like to even, I, do you do your layout so that you're 
those interior petition studs are also stacked when you're all across going across the, the joist that they're also stacked with your joist. So it's continuous all the way up. Yeah. When I, when I was first being taught, it was always the thought was minimize the amount of framing or make the framing work for the drywaller. Mm -hmm. And so if I like, let's say it was a closet wall, instead of pulling layout from the back wall of the house, I would just make it work for the drywaller. Okay. And then it was like, no, if we're going to switch to 24, everything needs to stack north, south, east, west. Mm -hmm. And so that's the thing I try to drill into the guys is you can usually, you're going to get close enough if you use the seam on the subfloor because we've laid out. But I always tell them, okay, this back wall is always going to be where we pull layout from. And then whatever the longest wall is going north, south. And that's just our rule. And that's one thing I've noticed too, is if you do that, and, and it's not just a drywall, the drywaller, you want to have the framing laid out so that they got stuff to nail to. But for all the sub trades, whether we're running duct work, whether we're running plumbing, whether we're running electric, all the trades that come in after me, they go, we wish everybody would frame houses like you guys, because we know when we drill a hole here or we cut this out, there's nothing down there we have to worry about because we know that you've got everything stacked up. And if I do, well, this gets beyond advanced framing, but if I do have something down there that I don't want them to use, I just, you know, exit out on the floor with some crayon, but that's usually negligible. Well, I never um, even thought about that. I, I was going to ask about mechanicals and do you guys have any feedback from, from plumbers and HVAC and electrical. And I never thought about the peace of mind of just knowing where everything is below each level of the floor without having to think about what am I going to run into? Yeah. Um, that's smart. Um, you know, it's a, it's, a, and it's a, it's something you learn. I don't know, Tim, because it's a, fa yours is a family business. You probably learn it because it made sense because you're getting feedback from the trades that we're going through after. Whereas if you were just a framer and you just framed as a framing subcontractor, you may not get that feedback from the, mm -hmm. from the mm -hmm. sub. So mm -hmm. I found, I picked it all up because being a, you know, a builder, general contractor, whether it was custom homes or spec homes, you know, I'm dealing with the subs as well as framing the houses. So they say, hey, if you could do this and save me a little time, then it helps us out and we can save you a little money on the overall install. So we would always do little things. That gets beyond the advanced framing. It's just smart framing for the trades that come afterwards. So, so why do you guys think that given all of the reasons why advanced framing makes sense to you both, why is it not the standard? <laughs> Isn't it kind of the hallmark of this industry tradition? Yes. You know, it's like for people to still keep squawking about OSB and maybe they've had personal experience and I'm not going to diminish that. We did. I remember the late eighties when dad first tried it out and it all just fell apart. It's like, maybe it's just that um, they got burned and now it's just 16 works, right? There's really nothing wrong with it. It's always going to work. Is there a major advantage in now taking some lumber out of the walls? I could see why people would be reticent to do that. But once you've done it, and, and again, like I said, we're not going all in. We're not using header hangers. We're not doing the single top plates. We're, do, we're basically just shifting all structural framing to 24 on center. I think if guys did it, they would go, oh, wait a second. The wall was a little bit lighter to lift. You know, there's a few less studs in the house. There's a little bit more. Like one of the advantages that no one ever talks about is that we can walk between stud bays much easier carrying things <laughs> yeah. with our cool bags on. And yep. it's like, when you have a wall that's back to 16, you go to walk through it and your, your tape measure and your hammer gets stuck. It's like, it's actually a little easier to work around. So it's just those little things too, that I think if people just experience, they'd go, okay. The thing that used to drive me crazy was walking onto jobs. Like, you know, like take the dog for a walk and stop by the house being built nearby or, or travel in the country for fine home building and seeing houses being built. It used to drive me nuts to see people who had switched to using two by sixes for energy reasons. Like they couldn't fit the amount of insulation they needed by code in a two by four wall. So they went, all right, we'll go two by six, but they did two by six, 16 on center. And it was like, just take that one more step and you have such a better wall. Um, and you're spending less money on lumber. And you know, it's like, it feels like that was the time when we, when it should have happened like that, that's when the shift should have happened. Everyone switch, started switching from away from two by fours all right, while they're, as long as they're switching, let's change this thing too, you know? Um, didn't seem what, to happen. <laughs> what's, surpri what's surprising to me is, you know, Tim, you made the point that, you know, there's just this momentum or just not changing of mindset, you know, and that's what's keeping regular straight 69 center platform framing going with stick as many studs and as many, you know, blocking in the wall as you need. 
But look at the time period between the 1940s and the 1950s. Within a half a generation, it went from all balloon framing to almost all platform framing. So that by 1960, you barely ever saw a, pla a balloon frame house. Whereas before 1950, it was basically, you know, 75% balloon right up until 1950. So that change just never happened in, you know, the late 70s after the, uh, the OVE advanced framing was developed by the USDA and, and the NAHB program under the, the HUD uh, initiative. So it just, I, I don't know why it didn't, you know, if there was just no, uh, there was nobody out there cheerleading it uh, and there were obvious advantages at the time. So they just gave up on it. We've got a couple of more specific questions just to circle back on. And these are, these are topics we touched on um, half inch or five eighths inch drywall for the interior. And um, is there any change there that people need to know about? Nope. Half All inch. Right. Yep. Um, uh, and um, what was the other one? Uh, interior interior walls, two, two by fours or two by sixes? Two yes. by for us and less structural. Yep. Yeah, the only time I use two by sixes is if we're going to be running some ducts through there, some extra wide plumbing walls. That's about right. it. Okay. Oh, Tim, we got a specific one for you. Are you balloon framing load bearing walls or just non load bearing walls? Um, both. Whatever we can, we, whatever we can build as tall as we can build it we will build it that way. Our, 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 our whole company mindset is try and keep us all as healthy as possible. So we'll, we'll build two stories with a gable, hang the windows, side them and lift them just like they do in Sweden. And then once they're up, we're not doing anything with scaffolding. I mean, the one house, I think I sent you a picture, Justin, all of the siding was from eye level and down. That's all we had to install later. And it was yep. like, Oh, what a breeze. Yep. So much easier. It's I've easy been... to keep things straight too. Cause you're not, you're not hanging off the scaffolding. We've been doing that for years. In fact, my brother and I learned how to paint walls because we'd paint all the siding while it was laying flat on the deck before we lift it up. So right. much easier, especially when you're up, you know, four stories with a walkout or something. It's just, you know, we don't want to have the painter going up there if they don't have to. No, it used to be like a sign of you were one of the guys in cool when you were the guy up on a plank siding, you know, you're three stories high and we didn't use any fall <laughs> protection. And it was like, okay, you were accepted and you know, none of us wanted to do it, but you did it because of peer pressure. And now it's the opposite. You're cool if you can avoid getting up at all on scaffolding in my yeah. view. Well, I mean, Tim, you've always been kind of a poster child for safety, which is really cool too. Um, uh, but can you talk a bit, a bit about how you're attaching the floor framing to to those tall walls? Yeah, so we're not letting things in, like the um, picture that you had shown, is what we've got, our engineer will specify, like either um, Fasten Master, like ledger locks, just like you'd use for a deck ledger. So it's the same principle, just like you frame your floor like you frame a deck. And then he tells us how many of the ledger locks he wants, or we, we really like the Simpson screws because they have the bigger head and they, mm -hmm. they suck nice and flat. And then we hanger the joists. In some cases, we can get away with pressure blocking the joists, depending on what he says you know, wow. how big the spans are. Really? What's, a, what's a pressure block? Explain that, because I don't think a lot of people are familiar with the term. It's essentially blocking in between the joists at the ledger and their size so that you can, and I've talked to our engineer, we'll get away with this at the ridge. It's however many blocks that the, or nails that the block is nailed to your ledger. And then you nail the joist into that and you kind of tone nail as you go through. And he just tells us how many nails. And it, it all depends on the span, but typically, there's not much load on a floor, especially when it goes across multiple interior walls. Mm -hmm. And so if it's a big span, of course, that would be eye joists and we'd never get away with that. But if they're small, like under 10 foot, and then we're able to use up all of our scrap. And so there's no, so the pressure blocks are taking the place of the hanger in that instance. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Okay. Yep. It's funny that you guys, the teacher. you guys, you guys both have this mentality of using up scrap. And I know Mike, when you were building <laughs> that, when you were building that house in 2016 for us, I remember a blog post you did that was, you took a picture of all the scrap that was left over after framing the house. And it was a very small little neat pile in one corner. Yep. Like, like you put in the back of a hatchback. and <laughs> take to Well, the no, it, it, it fit in the back of my old Ranger. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that seems like another point of pride. Um, but, you know, for most, re most framers on a job, they're not going to find it efficient with their time to be that meticulous about using up all the scraps. So I only do that because um, I don't really 
care how long it takes me to do things. Right. And um, do you, will you take it as far as designing on two foot centers? Or, I mean, sorry, not two foot centers, two foot thinking in two foot increments in order to minimize waste? No, I don't. I don't. No. Do you, who designs your houses, Tim? Tim We've got this guy, Jay, that used to, when I was a kid, driving around with dad, we'd go and visit Jay and it was all hand drawn in the eighties. And so he draws with AutoCAD now and has, so he still does our stuff. I think he lives in Idaho now. So we just email over and, and he's a good designer. We never work with architects. We just work with Jay. Does, does he, does he try to stick on any modules like a two foot module or anything, or is it just whatever suits the design of the house that you're going for, for the lot? That is a good question, Mike. Um, if he does, I never realized it till now. But I don't think we ever get those weird numbers like that back wall's 39 foot six. It's, I think it typically would be 38 or 40 feet. Okay, so he's... Yeah, he probably just does. He also designs the company he actually works for. They do, they design like cockpit and bridges for boats. So he works for like a nautical architect. architect. And, hmm. and he's just really good. So he's probably got all that stuff going through his head as he's designing. And it just happens that we benefit from it. Um, are you guys seeing seeing anything or do you know of anything uh, that people should be aware of in terms of using advanced framing and dealing with seismic situations or fire or anything like that? Um, I know, I mean, for instance, fire, I know a lot of people talk about eye joists and fires and, you know, you shouldn't use those because firefighters, they'll burn up too quick and firefighters will crash through the floors. I'm just saying what the, what the, the common knee jerk is. Um, are there any common knee jerks like that for advanced framing in terms of seismic or fire or high winds or earth, you know, anything like that? I've not heard of any. The only thing for us on the seismic side, and there is an APA, it's a footnote in one of their articles about fully sheathing the wall. So here in Washington, I think Oregon, California, British Columbia, it is just standard that the entire house is fully sheathed with structural sheeting, which significantly minimizes the amount of hardware, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So normally our, our nailing spacing is six inches on the ed edges and 12 inches in the field. Switching to 24, it's six inches everywhere. And so the panel has the exact same number of nails either way. It's just, you have one stud running down the middle of the panel. Okay. That's it. That's, I mean, literally that's been our only change. The only thing is really following load pass and the, um, the engineer will tell us certain walls that maybe there's not enough shear value that we have to, you know, put blocking at the headers and sills and run strapping across the, um, the openings so that all those panels basically, um, the, the load path goes all the way through the wall and that's it. We haven't had anything else to deal with. And somebody mentioned earlier too, about 24 on center framing for the floor especially with eye joists, you don't necessarily have to go deeper because they have different series eye joists. So you, you just might go up a series for yeah. one section of the house. I mean, right. it, they've got it all figured out. You know, they've got the frequency of vibration. You just tell them what you want and then they'll, they'll design it back. Great. The, um, the, the, another thing to uh, address would be roofs and roof framing. If there's anything. So when, when you opened up, Justin, you were talking about what the uh, advantages of advanced framing are. Mm -hmm. And a lot, and one of the things nowadays that most people are using it for is for energy efficiency. And you do get some extra efficiency by getting more insulation in. And there are ways of changing the way you frame roofs that will enable you to get more insulation in the, that attic space. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're using trusses, that can be easily done by just using an Arkansas truss or an energy heel truss where you can just raise the top cord off of the bottom cord where it meets the exterior wall. There's a few different ways that they can do that. But when I'm, plat when I'm uh, conventionally framing a roof, what I'll usually do is rather than having the, the ceiling joist coming down and then bringing the rafter to sit alongside the uh, ceiling joist and rest on the top plate of the wall, is I'll actually frame a rim joist around that essentially what will be the attic floor and then dropping the, the tail of the rafter right on top of that floor. And that way you're gaining the height, not only the height above plate of the rafter, you're also gaining the height of your ceiling joists, mm -hmm. which would essentially be your attic floor. So a little, I mean, that, that's just, it's not advanced framing necessarily. It's just taking that, 
little advantages of getting more insulation where you would ordinarily have compressed areas and, and getting a little more uh, R value out of it. Yeah, it's, um, I wonder if that stuff should start to be lumped under, like is it time for advanced framing 2.0, you know? <laughs> Well, that's what I do on my regular training that I, I do for my local builders association, kind of throw in a lot of little things that are ancillary to advanced framing, but, but kind of in that same theme. So if for just kind of little parting thoughts here, um, if you guys were running crews and or you, you were builders and you were not doing the work yourself and, or you, you were talking to somebody at a, at a trade show or here in this, webinar audience and they want to get in they want to get their crew their framing crew into doing 24 on center you know let's say the framing crew is that has always done 16 that's what they do for everybody else's houses but you want them to do 24 where do you start them i mean do you throw them do you just throw them in the deep end and say i want here's the plans i want it to be like this or do you what do you start with what's the low-hanging fruit for transitioning over for baby steps <sighs> I mean, is, it, is it just simply hey, don't change anything else but put studs 24 inches on center? That's what I would say. I mean, that's what we've done. And it was just, it was painless. In fact, the other day I was laying something out 16 on center. I forget what it was for. Oh, it was for a deck that will have like treks on it or something. And I started laying out two foot. And I was like, oh, that's right. I got to go back to the red <laughs> instead of every two foot, you know, two, four, six, eight makes the math real easy. So yeah. I, I, I I don't see a framer balking at that part, especially if you leave the double top plates and nothing else changes. And then over time, like in our case, we, we don't build up headers. It's either gonna be a four by 10 with foam on it, or it's gonna be a piece of inch and three quarter, which is I think how, the, how we'll finally get it done. As now we're engineering all of our houses just to make certain building departments easier to work with. So he can just do that as a standard. And it's easy. If you don't change anything else besides spacing, it's, I, don't, I just, it's less material to move and the math is easy. So, yeah. I, I talked to one production framer a number of years ago. I, I had a period of time, maybe 15 years ago, 12 years, 15 years ago, where for a few years I was hopping around working, consulting with production framers in Texas and North Carolina and Montana and a few other places. So it was kind of interesting to see how they each work both operationally and out in the field in the, in the production managers and that were managing just subcontractors. So speaking specifically about framing, um, one crew in Texas or one company in Texas, I asked them, well, you're doing advanced framing. This is unusual because everybody else had, wasn't. I said, how did you get your framers? And they had several different independent framing companies doing their framing for them. You know, some crews of, you know, five, six people. And he said, we gave them the plans. We said, here's the lumber. Anything that you use, oh, this, what you see here is exactly what you need to build this house. <laughs> if you need any more lumber, you buy it and you bring it here. And then they pointed out all of the key things that they changed. They said, these headers do not have jacks. And they read it all out on the plans because they have an in-house designer and they just made a change that way. And they said after the first house, everything was switched and they didn't have to retrain any crew because they realized that it amounted to several hundred dollars. And for a lot of these production framers in these, these neighborhoods, they're really not making a whole lot of money. They're doing, mm -hmm. they're getting beat down by the competition. This was a few years ago though, when, when things were a little busier back in the early 2000s and, and, and there was plenty of workforce at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that I think is important to mention because a lot of people think, you know, in order to build an energy efficient home, you've really got to go to the, the advanced framer. Some people think this what some of the studies that I've seen have shown or energy modeling is that you can go with 12 on center, double, triple top plates. You can put triple jacks under every double, triple two by 12 header you want for over frame your walls. If you put exterior wall sheathing, excuse me, exterior insulation on the walls, you almost negate all of the advantages of advanced framing. Yep. I, um, I've the, read the same things. The thermal bridging is broken. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're, if you're looking at it to, to be energy efficient, it would work if you're just framing your regular stud walls with the sheathing and then, and then siding on the outside. But as soon as you're adding exterior foam, then start rethinking some of the things that might seem a little squirrely to you, like uh, single top plates. 
-hmm. you know, but if you do want the advantage of, of advanced framing from a thermal perspective, just eliminating on a two by six whole wall analysis. If you go to 24 on center framing, you minimize the headers or right size of your headers, and you're just going from a double top plate to a single top plate, you will gain an extra 0.5 R value out of your whole wall analysis just by eliminating that one extra plate. So there's lots of ways to play around with this. The only way to really know is to do some energy modeling. Um, and, and a lot of good designers nowadays, architects as well as engineers, are becoming very familiar with energy modeling and um, they can they can tell you what's going to work and be economical for you and practical. Great. Well, you guys have been awesome. Um, you know, again, findhomebuilding.com slash webinars is where you can find a recording of this podcast. Um, we'll, we're also going to put up there as many of the, the links to things that we have mentioned here. Uh, uh, I know we talked about a couple of different builders, a couple of past fine home building articles, we talked about the APA guide. Um, uh, I've talked about a couple of products, the Simpson hangers. So we'll make sure that we, we get that information on there. Uh, so people can click through to see that. Um, and we hope that you guys will, will join us for the next one of these. Good. Beautiful. All right, guys. Thanks very much. Thanks Good for the talking to you guys. So long. Stay safe, everybody.